Hey everyone, Dr. T here, and you're listening to Concentrates, a podcast about cannabis science, news, and hot topics. So today I'm going to be going through this article published by ASU News titled Study Examines Medicinal Recreational Cannabis Markets. Uh, This article is by Joe Kaspermeyer. And let's get into it. The researchers looked at state regulations, potential public health risks. So definitely have a lot to say about this article. Um, So here we go. A new study urges that state and federal regulators need to take a closer look at the health and safety risks of the growing medicinal and recreational cannabis market. Perhaps they do. Typically, the federal government will be the ones who do the research to decide what kinds of pesticides are allowed on what kinds of crops and what levels of residuals are acceptable and unacceptable. And there'll be these uh, levels and you know chemicals that are allowed and disallowed are all determined by scientific studies that look at the risk, the health risk of 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 these different chemicals and contaminants to the end consumer. Uh, With cannabis, since it is a, since it is a federally illegal substance still, particularly THC uh, containing cannabis, there is, there has been no research, federal research to look at what is acceptable and what is not acceptable as far as pesticide go, pesticides go as far as, contaminants, you know, like microbial levels or heavy metals, you know, what, what is safe and unsafe? It's just never been studied with the power that the the federal government can put behind it. Cannabis regulation is unlike any agricultural commodities, food, or drugs in the U.S. Currently, there are no national level guidelines based on conventional risk assessment methodologies or knowledge of patient susceptibility in medical use of cannabis, said lead author Max Leung, an Arizona State University assistant professor in the School of Mathematical and Natural Sciences. Therefore, our research team conducted the first comprehensive study to examine three main concerns. One, the current landscape of state-level contaminant regulations. Two, identifying cannabis contaminants of concern in samples. And three, explore any patient populations who may be susceptible to contaminants. So, yeah, so generally, and, and it seems like they, this author recognizes this, that if you're a healthy person, the normal kinds of contaminants found in cannabis at, at average levels aren't going to generally cause any kind of uh, health problem or any other kind of problem. Um, but if you are already sick, some kind of medical condition, immunocompromised, um, or just otherwise made susceptible to, um, uh, some kind of heavy metal or microorganism, uh, then, then you're more likely to be harmed by these contaminants. And so who is more likely to be harmed by what? That's point three there. You know, if, if you have cancer, and you're on chemo, what kind of contaminants are now uh, more worrisome for you? And what ones are still of no, you know, little concern, you know, so you're not just avoiding things that could be useful for you because you're avoiding all contaminants when, you know, maybe some level of a given contaminant may be okay, and uh, but another contaminant would not be okay at all. And then, yeah, the current, so going back to number one, the current landscape of state level contaminant regulations is all over the map, which we'll talk about in this article. And um, identifying cannabis contaminants of concern in samples. So that could be talking about either, you know, identifying as in what are the kinds of contaminants that are possible in cannabis generally versus, you know, how do you identify cannabis or contaminants in a given sample of cannabis? So how does the analytical lab handle a sample properly to be able to identify and quantify those contaminants? 
The cannabis market has grown significantly in the past decade from a $10 billion industry in 2017 to what is projected to be a $50 billion industry by 2026. We shall see, but um, I think everything's pretty much on track for that. And as long as more markets open up and continue to open up, it will definitely grow. And uh, if it became federally legalized, that would be uh, very interesting. Um, I wouldn't anticipate that now or anytime soon at this point. Um, and within the past year, an estimated 55 million users. So I don't know if that is a global or a United States figure. Um, seems a little high to be a United States figure, but we'll, but you know, I'll look into that. Currently, 15 states have made medicinal cannabis legal, but little attention has been paid to its implications in chemical exposure and consumer safety. Um, I disagree with this. I feel like there's been a lot of attention focused on this as somebody that's been involved in rulemaking and uh, lawmaking uh, in Colorado or the lawmaking process and rulemaking process in Colorado and have witnessed a lot of this, there is a lot of attention on chemical exposure, on contaminant exposure and consumer safety, almost to a fault, in fact, I would argue, um, where maybe they're not testing things that are even meaningful anymore. They're just testing for the sake of testing to feel like they're testing enough. Um, and, or maybe by requiring more testing, they're really just, um, uh, going to encourage subversion, which is, you know, going to move us further from the goalpost. And maybe there's other ways to achieve compliance and, and safely tested and adequately tested cannabis. Um, but uh, anyway, at the federal level, cannabis is still listed as an illegal substance. True. Uh, schedule one, uh, no medicinal value. Um, and uh, high potential for abuse is the definition of a Schedule One drug, and that's what how cannabis is classified. It is absolute bullshit. It's been proven uh, many times that that there are plenty of potential medicinal uses, and it also is not uh, uh, does not carry a high potential for abuse. Can some people abuse it? Absolutely, but there are lots of things that people can abuse. In fact, basically anything can be abused. So, um, and, you know, so let's just say sugar and I'll leave that there. At the, uh, let's see, this limits the efforts of several federal agencies in assessing and mitigating the public health risk of cannabis contamination. Like what I was talking about before, typically the federal government and the, you know, these agencies, FDA and whatnot do research about the contaminants of food and drug items, um, but they're not able to do this because of the Schedule One status. Currently, cannabis is neither federally regulated as an agricultural food or a pharmaceutical commodity, so the USDA does not monitor its growth and the FDA does not consider it a drug. So, I mean, yes and no, I guess. So. It's not federally regulated as an agricultural food. Um, now, yeah, not even hemp. I don't think that, well, the USDA regulates hemp growing, but I don't, I think they do regulate it as a food because of hemp seed oil. And that's, a, that's available. You can eat that hemp seeds, hemp seed oil. Um, so that's technically, but not, not uh, high THC cannabis that you find in medical and recreational markets. So those are not regulated as food. Um, and then as far as the pharmaceutical commodity, yeah, most of the available cannabis is not regulated as a pharmaceutical commodity, but there is one pharmaceutical commodity or actually a couple pharmaceutical commodities that are cannabis inspired or cannabis based. So Epidiolex being a CBD, um, a cannabis extract of CBD, and then um, Marinol being a synthetic version of THC. Um, but yeah, so the USDA does not monitor its growth and the FDA does not consider it a drug. That's true about the USDA when it comes to, to THC cannabis, 
but they do monitor the growth of hemp. So how is a cannabis user to know what they're putting into their bodies is safe? There are, there's surprisingly limited information on the contaminant level of cannabis products sold in this country, Leung said. And this is true. So, and actually, I want to talk about this for a minute. So when a, in a state regulated marketplace before cannabis goes to, uh, to be sold, um, a, a sample of that batch. So say they grow 10 pounds of, of marijuana flower, cannabis flower. Uh, they have to take a certain number of grams, say, you know, 10, 20 grams of that flour into a separate container and try to make it representative. Ideally, is what they're supposed to be doing is taking it from different parts of this 10 pounds and making it representative of the, excuse me, of the whole batch. And they're putting that into a container and sending that to a, a testing laboratory. And the testing laboratory will test that for um, THC, potency, you know, so how much THC is in it, how much CBD is in it, a, a, number, a number of other cannabinoids are also tested and quantified. And that's what the, the manufacturers ultimately able, allowed to put on the label for sale. Um, but then they're, they're also testing for contaminants to, you know, make sure it's safe, right? So, so microbial contamination, pesticide contamination, heavy metal contamination. And then if, these contaminants don't exceed certain levels. The testing lab says, yes, this can, this can be sold in the state level marketplace. But uh, what I just said is, is the key to this. If they don't exceed certain levels, they can be present. So uh, mercury could be present. Let's say the limits to whatever, two PP B two parts per billion. I'm just making it up. Let's just say in, in, a made up state somewhere, the limit for mercury is two parts per billion. Well, and let's say my analytical instrumentation can detect all the way down to 0.1 part per billion. And then I take this, I measure this sample that came in and it comes in at one part per billion. I, j I see that. I see that this has some mercury in it, but it didn't exceed the threshold set by the state. So it is okay for sale according to the state. And that goes um, on to be sold. But the consumer is never told about that one part per billion of mercury. That's not listed anywhere. It's not really accessible to the consumer. Some states, I think, technically require that you have the certificates of analysis for everything that you're selling available in the store. In practice, I don't think that that ever happens. I think states have moved away from this because it is basically impossible to do. Um, so you would never know. And not saying that that would necessarily be a huge problem, but it could be depending on who you are. Like we talked about with, um, you know, if you're susceptible to something you, just because it passed heavy metal testing and you're super sensitive to mercury, maybe um, doesn't mean it didn't have any in it. Um, same with microbials. It can pass microbial testing and have um, quite a quite a few growable microbes um, in it. So how do you know, you know, um, and that's, you know, where, I, you know, having trusted companies that, you know, um, becomes very important. And, you know, no company is putting out 100% contaminant free product ever of anything. And this, this isn't just cannabis I'm talking about. I'm talking about food, medicine, uh, you know, nothing is 100% perfect and contaminant free. Um, so you have to find the companies that you trust to do the best possible job. So they have processes that, that only allow the minimal amount of contaminants through. Um, without any federal guidelines, it's been in, left entirely up to the states to craft a patchwork of cannabis regulations and policy. And that's true. So the, each state has had, had to do this, starting with Washington and Colorado, um, in 2012, when voter referenda um, in each state passed adult use cannabis um, or allowed for adult use cannabis. And then that's when the adult use stores started cropping up. But medical dispensaries go all the way back into the 90s, beginning with California and Washington was another early adopter back then. Colorado was actually a late adopter on the medical front, 
relatively. I think in uh, 2005 ish is when they had a medical program start, but then they were very early, very quick to jump into recreational being one of the first two along with Washington back in 2012. So, um, they had the tough, super tough job of, of uh, then, back then of setting up totally new systems with really nothing to go off of other than their, you know, medical systems that were very loosey goosey. And so they had to s- decide on some, on some things. They had to decide on what is, uh, what contaminants are we going to test for? What levels are we going to allow? And, um, you know, and then they've been in flux and changing ever since. So every year, the the during rulemaking in Colorado, for example, the analytical testing gets tinkered with. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You know, they don't have to tinker with it every year. But, you know, that's something that they like to tinker with a lot because they're trying to stay up with the science and, you know, Oh, you know, now one person in California with cancer, highly immunocompromised, died from aspergillus, and now we need to test everything for it because it's been detected here. And, you know, I think there's a lot of room for open discussion about how necessary that is. Um, But, you know, that's kind of what the things that happen. Or maybe, you know, remember with um, that summer where all the... Uh, vaping lung disease became a big thing where people uh, that were consuming, ultimately they were knockoff THC vape pens were getting this weird lung disease um, and showing up in hospitals. And then they ultimately linked that back to vitamin E acetate. So now um, vitamin E acetate wasn't listed as, as a banned inhalable substance anywhere that was on anybody's radar. Who could have, who would have even predicted that vitamin E acetate would be so toxic when inhaled? Um, but once it was just uh, kind of linked to that, um, and I don't think ever really definitively proven, but, um, but it's assumed that that was the, what caused those vape lung diseases. And now that, uh, vitamin E acetate is banned in many States from, um, you know, listed as a banned substance for use in vapor, vaporizable, inhalable cannabis. Um, you can still use it in a topical cause that's what it was really designed for is to stabilize vitamin E in like, um, lotions and topical applications. So, uh, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, so Washington and Colorado have been, um, had the heavy lifting with making these, these, uh, regulations. And then every other States have, have the States that have legalized since have basically started with Washington and Colorado regulations, um, as their basis and made, certain tweaks here and there. Oregon did a lot of work with pesticide, um, setting pesticide limits early on and other states actually followed suit after them with the pesticide limits. Um, there were, weren't, there was no pesticide testing going on in Washington or Colorado in the first couple of years, at least, uh, when, when, uh, recreational adult use cannabis became available. From their study, Leung and colleagues found that as of May, 36 states and the District District of Columbia have listed a total of 679 cannabis contaminants as regulated in medical or recreational cannabis. Most of these contaminants were pesticides, 551, which included 174 insecticide, 160 herbicide, and 123 fungicide subcategories followed by solvents 74, microbes 21, inorganic compounds 12, mycotoxins 5, and 16 classified as other. So uh, what's this talking about? These are the kinds of contaminants that are found and tested for in cannabis. Um, Pesticides, uh, the reason that there's so many is because there's just so many different chemical pesticides that have been developed by companies over the decades. And then uh, what's interesting is that in, uh, whether it's a pesticide, as you think of a pesticide, as you know, it's going to kill a bug or a rodent or something, um, you know, an insecticide, a rodenticide, um, whether it's that um, or an herbicide or fungicide, it's all classified as a pesticide under regulations. It's just all lumped as and called pesticides. So even the um, you know, the weed killers and stuff like that are still considered pesticides in the regulatory world. Um, solvents, a lot of solvents are used to extract cannabis, and some of them can have 
uh, effects if they're found, you know, negative side effects if they're found at too high of levels or, or long-term health impacts if they're found at too high of levels. So these uh, examples of these are like butane, ethanol, um, iso, iso or propane, um, and other solvents, you don't want to have too much of those in there. So um, after extractions, they need to be tested for microbes, anything from E. coli to salmonella um, to just total um, total plate count. So just everything that grows, these are these are tested for and measured. And, and there's cutoff limits for how much is allowed. Um, some of them are zero tolerance. So salmonella and E. coli generally bear a zero tolerance. So if one colony forming unit is found it is uh that's an automatic failure for that batch um, but others like uh total plate count is usually allowed up to ten thousand or maybe a hundred thousand depending on the state um and then inorganic compounds that's most likely referring mostly to heavy metals so lead mercury chromium Mycotoxins are a specific subset of, of toxic, highly toxic chemicals that are produced by certain fungi. Um, so uh, this is what you're really concerned with, um, with aspergill, aspergillus and other, um, other fung, fung, fungi. They produce toxins and they can cause immediate health effects and also long-term health effects like cancer and things like that. So they're... Um, uh, they can be tested for, which could be, you know, could be a good idea depending on the application. And then 16 classified as other, uh, maybe water activity, um, moisture content, maybe the, uh, potency fell under this. I don't know. So I don't know what, uh, what else is under other. What was interesting is that many pesticides in this document were highly unlikely to be utilized in cannabis cultivation and processing, Leung said. These pesticides included chlorprofim, a plant hormone that prevents potatoes from sprouting, oxytetracycline, an antibiotic, and norfluorazon, an aquatic herbicide for hydrilla control. So, um, and just to wrap this up, actually, so what was also alarming to us is that the U.S. EPA tolerance document and in individual jurisdictions also listed a total of 42 legacy pesticides that were no longer registered for any agricultural use in the U.S., such as DDT, chlordane, lindane, and parathion. So essentially what they're talking about here is that um, a lot of the pesticides that are on the, those banned pesticides list are also further federally banned for all purposes and manufacture in the United States. So their presence in the country is highly unlikely. And so the odds that some cannabis farmer somewhere would get their hands on it and use it is so unbelievably remote that they're hardly worth putting onto this list and, you know, kind of further gumming up regulations. But Many of them, uh, you know, like mycobutanil is acceptable for use in strawberries, um, but it's not acceptable for use in cannabis, you know, because you eat strawberries and, it, and it's relative, you know, you know, relatively non-toxic when you eat it. But if you ignite it and, and burn it, it actually releases cyanide. <clears throat> so in addition to any toxicity it may have innately, it also releases cyanide when you're <clears throat> burning and inhaling it. So it's not allowed for use in cannabis. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's, so those are good ones to test for, actually test for, um, for a testing lab because they're available in the marketplace and they are effective when, uh, used as a pesticide, but they're not appropriate for use on cannabis. So you could see somebody, um, maybe using that, uh, inadvertently or otherwise. So it's good to test for it. <clears throat> Let's see. As to the amount of contaminants levels, there were large inconsistencies from state to state. Different state jurisdictions showed significant variations in regulated contaminants and action levels ranging up to four orders of magnitude. So four orders of magnitude, that's talking about like, so if, if Washington allows one part per billion of, of, uh, of mercury, four orders of magnitude could be going down to 
0.0001 part per billion of mercury allowed in Colorado, or could be going the other way up to, um, that would be 10,000 parts per billion or something like, you know, parts per thousand or something. I don't know. Um, off the top of my head, I could figure all that out. But basically, you're talking about going from, you know, allowing, you know, um, one part to 10,000 parts in a different state. And so that could be, have huge ramifications for health or just even, you know, how easy it is to pass, uh, get cannabis to pass into the marketplace and be uh, accepted in the state and, and, and then change, you know, um, motivations for subversion, uh, testing subversion. But, um, so the, basically one state to another, you could, could have huge differences in what, what they say is a passing level versus a non-passing level and have almost base also, by the way, have almost no basis or real justification for why it's one number and another. They're almost random at this point. Um, so how often was this a problem? The research team also mined data testing records of cannabis flower and extract samples produced in California, the largest state cannabis market in the U.S. Their sample data represented about 6% of California's legal production in 2020 to 2021. As mandated by California's Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act, all cannabis and cannabis products in the legal market of California are required to be tested for 68 pesticides, four inorganics, 20 solvents, six microbes, and five mycotoxins, Leung said. The cannabis manufacturers must submit their products, including cannabis flowers and cannabis products such as edibles, concentrates, and other consumables, to a state licensed cannabis testing laboratory. All products must be certified for compliance testing before they can be sold legally. The products that failed the state's regulatory levels in the compliance testing are subject to recalls. Um, generally, they're not finding this out after the fact. They're just never released to the marketplace. Um, but I, unless they, um, but some, it is on occasion tested again after or, you know, sometimes a mistake is made in reporting and it's found out that, oh, no, that, you know, the testing lab said initially that it was, um, oh yeah, there's only, or there's no E. coli in this. And then, um, so you put it out in the market, you send it out to your customers and then they they come back, you know, a week later and they're like, um, so we made a mistake and there was E. coli in that. And now, now you have to recall it. So that does happen, but, um, that's generally more rare. Generally they're catching this before it even makes it to, the marketplace and then it's destroyed or um, sometimes it's acceptable to decontaminate or, or remediate. So that would be to do something to either remove the contaminant from the product as is or to alter, change the product as a way of removing it. So that's if you, you know, for example, if a cannabis flower fails microbial contamination, you can extract it and then um, the microbes all die and are left behind in the process. And so um, it cleans it up as you process it further. <clears throat> the tallied, they tallied an overall failure rate of 5.1% for the California cannabis samples, which included an average of the failure rate of 2.3% identified for flowers and 9.2% for extracts in California samples. So why are extracts failing so much? Why are they so much dirtier? Um, well, it's probably solvents, residual solvents. And if it fails for residual solvents, generally you can send the batch back into the purging ovens and try to get more of it out and send another sample and it can still go through. So there's lower risk with those tests. Um, and, and so um, that's why you see a higher failure rate for extracts than, than flowers. Insecticides and fungicides were the most prevalent categories of detected contaminants with boscolid and chlorpyrifos being the most common. So I don't know if those are banned or allowed and, and going over the limit. Some are banned. So they're, if, they're, if they're detected in the sample, it's an automatic failure. Some they're allowed, but you can't, you just, you can't like drown the plant in it and then sell it to people all, you know, soaked with pesticides. So there's gotta be some kind of limit. So it'll be allowed pesticide, but it'll, 
exceed the limit. Um, the contaminant concentrations fell below the regulatory action levels in many legalized jurisdictions, indicating a higher risk of contaminant exposure. So that's what I was saying earlier, where, you know, it can be detected, but be below the actionable limit. And then you are consuming a certain amount of it, um, whether, uh, and you won't know it because that will never be reported to you as a consumer. All right. Lastly, Leung's team reviewed the medical cannabis use reports released by state level public health agencies from 2016 to 2021. Currently, there are 37 U.S. medical cannabis programs and close to 100 qualifying medical conditions listed by these programs. So most states have at least some kind of access to medical cannabis. Some of it, some of the states, it's only only kind of a name only, you know, it's really actually not available because they're so restrictive that no company could make a profit. And so it doesn't really exist. That, that happens. Um, but generally the, over time, the people do convince the government to loosen up the restrictions to make these markets viable. Um, and then if it's a medical program, a lot of states list particular conditions that are allowed and that can be different from state to state. So a big one is pain. If a state lists pain, you're going to have a, a robust can cannabis market because it's a lot of people have pain and cannabis helps a lot of people with pain. And so you'll get a lot of cannabis prescriptions when you allow pain. If you don't allow pain, it can be much harder to have a robust and, um, and good quality cannabis marketplace because you just don't have this, uh, uh, the same number of patients. And we'll, we'll get to that in this article, actually. Um, cannabis and cannabis products are often marketed as alternative options to standard medical treatments, Leung said. As such, medical cannabis can potentially expose susceptible patients to harmful contaminants. It, it potentially can. And so that's why you need to mitigate against that by, one, finding a trusted brand, trusted companies, and two, consuming appropriate cannabis in appropriate forms. So, excuse me. So for example, if you're immunocompromised cancer patient, don't smoke joints, you know, look at concentrates, look at edibles. They'll be much safer for you. Um, immunocompromised patients with cancer and HIV, women of reproductive age and patients with seizures and epilepsy are among those who are more susceptible to the health hazards of pesticide and microbial contaminants that may be found in cannabis. Very true. Those are all groups that um, are, are more susceptible and, and perhaps for higher levels of testing would be appropriate for people who um, are in those groups but still need cannabis medicine. The majority of patients were prescribed medical cannabis for use in alleviating pain. Nearly 800,000 patients followed by PTSD, 164,000 patients, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury, 78,000 patients, cancer, 44,000 patients, and epilepsy, 21,000 patients. So like I said, pain is the most common reason that cannabis is ever prescribed. And so if pain is allowed as a, a, a condition in a, in a state, you will have a good marketplace because you will have, well, it's, all, it's more patients than the, 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 net, the rest of the top. Um, conditions combined, you know, PTSD is a diff, dis, distant second, but also to me kind of a surprising second place um, uh, disease that's uh, uh, prescribed for medical cannabis. But um, I think it's great that if it's working for people. Our findings have two important public health implications, Leung said. First, the scattershot approach of regulations at the state level can confuse cannabis manufacturers and discourage compliance while subjecting cannabis users to a higher level of contaminant exposure in some jurisdictions. Second, given the current status of cannabis contaminant risk regulation in the U.S., it is unclear whether the health benefit of cannabis usage outweighs the health risk of exposure to cannabis-borne contaminants. Okay, so on that first point that, that the scattershot approach is confusing, well, most cannabis companies are individual to the state. There are very few multi-state operators, relatively speaking. There are very few cannabis companies that operate in different states, but they're well aware of this patchwork of regulations. So 
they, there's a whole professional class of people, compliance officers, who read these rules for their state and really understand them. And they go around the company and um, make sure that everything's being done according to those rules. And so it's actually a very important job and it's done. It's fine. I don't think that the confusing, I don't think it's confusing people to the point where, you know, they're, they're discouraging compliance. No, you, they're hiring professional compliance officers in each state and in its, and um, there are other reasons to subvert compliance, but I don't think that's one of them. Um, or other, other reasons that people do subvert compliance, I should say not to, you shouldn't subvert compliance, you know? So, um, that second point that it's unclear whether the health benefit of cannabis, cannabis usage outweighs the health risk of exposure to cannabis borne contaminants. I'd agree that like, that's pretty, un it's unclear in that it hasn't been totally defined and it hasn't been de defined for each subpopulation either at-risk populations versus a healthy individual. Um, however, it, it, that's something that's going to be an individual choice of whether the, the, um, the benefit you're getting from using cannabis outweighs the potential harms that you could face. That's your own individual assessment to make and, um, you know, discuss it with your doctor. To help better inform the public and policymakers, Leung recommends further investigations to examine the safety considerations in susceptible patient populations across all medical across all medical conditions. I 100% agree. More research is absolutely necessary. Um, the progression and prognosis of many qualifying conditions may be worsened by exposure to detected contam contaminants in cannabis. True, it could be. Um, and, the, and so you, you do need to be careful and find a good trusted company. Don't just be buying the cheapest thing. This study demonstrates an urgent need for a unified regulatory approach to mitigate the public health risk of cannabis contamination at a national level. Yeah, I, I agree. National resources would be able to, to um, you know, put the appropriate amount of money to do the research necessary to figure out what are the contaminants that can be possibly present, what levels are they typically present, um, what levels are, are okay for the typical healthy adult user, and what levels are okay for people who have specific conditions. And, and so that can guide how patients approach um, the kind of cannabis that they that they consume, you know, whether that's the form of cannabis, so uh, inhaling, smoking, eating, um, or the um, just the approach to cannabis medicine that they would like to take in general. Um, so this is a very good article, had a lot of good information. Um, I will leave the link to this article below. And uh, thank you, everyone for listening. And I'll see you next time.